We have apologies from Bruce Fackerson, who's substituted by Scott Simon. George McDonald will join at four o'clock, um, substituted by Neil McDonald. Apologies from Ken Mulroy, Alistair Robertson, Susan Webb, substitute Jill, Gillian Evans. And I'll just do a roll call now. Councillor Lane. Present. Councillor Wheeler. Present. Councillor Alex Nicholl. Here. Councillor Greg. Here. Angela Scott. Here. Gail Beatty. Here. Neil MacDonald. Here. Caroline Hiscox. Julian Evans. Here. Luanne Grujon. Here. Scott Simon. Here. Gordon McDougall. You can see Gordon is here. Uh, Paul O'Connor. Here. Apologies, I, I was muted, sorry. I'm here, it's Gordon. Thank you. Jonathan Smith. Here. Carl Ledecker. Yes. Yeah. Duncan Coburn. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Richard McCallum. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Robertson. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, it is a virtual meeting, so obviously those who are in the chamber, if you want to speak, can just raise your hand and I'll keep an eye out for that. Those who are joining us virtually, um, you can use the hand raise function and um, officers will keep an eye on that for me, I think, and give me a nudge um, if we uh, if I don't spot you. So um, hopefully that'll, that'll work for everybody today. So the first uh, item is, is there any declarations of interest at all? Not seeing anybody indicating, so we'll take that as a, a no. Thank you. The first item of business then is the minute of the previous meeting, which took place on 7th of July, and the minute is here for approval. I think we've uh, there were a couple of actions from the previous minute, which I think have now been fully actioned. Are we happy to approve the minute? Yeah, not seeing any dissension from that, so I'll take that as yes. Um, next item 1.2, which is the minute of the meeting of the management group, which took place on the 11th of August and is here for information. Any issues on that or are we happy to move on? OK, thank you for that. That then takes us on to item 1.3, which is this uh, Community Planning Aberdeen Board Forward Planner, which is here um, just uh, indicating reports that are likely to come at future meetings and the ones obviously that are tabled today. Happy to agree that? Yes, thank you. And then that takes us on to item 1.4, which is the national update from uh, Richard McCallum. So welcome, Richard. We're glad that you're here with us. I think in our normal practice, we did put out um, an email to members asking if there were any questions and I think there was one um, that we tabled in relation to the uh, National Care Service and the ongoing engagement around that. Um, so I'll hand over to you Richard and you can maybe um, respond to that and any other information that you want to give us in your update. Thank you. Yeah thanks uh, Chair and good afternoon everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me okay. Um, so yeah, I'll come to that point in, in just a second, but uh, just a, a couple of other things to, to update on first as well. So as is the case, I think at, at, at a local level, there's uh, obviously a lot going on at a national government uh, level at the moment. We're uh, into a, a new parliamentary term and obviously coming with that has been a, a slightly new form of government as well. So uh, colleagues will be uh, probably aware of the uh, cooperation agreement that was agreed uh, at the end of August between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Greens and it was accepted by uh, both parties involved at the end of August and that has meant uh, a confirmation of um, uh, two new ministers uh, uh, Patrick Harvey and Lorna Slater from the Green Party 
um, one uh, responsible for uh, Minister for Zero Carbon Buildings, Active Travel and Tenant Rights, and uh, one being responsible for Green Skills, Circular Economy and Biodiversity. Di so there could be some relevance uh, in the roles of these two ministers for the work of this group, but perhaps as, as well. Um, uh, beyond that, um, the programme for government was published um, on the 7th of September. I think that was just last week. It feels a lot longer ago. Um, uh, the PFG was uh, designed to build on the work that was done in the first 100 days of the, the new administration. That, that first 100 days included uh, the publication of, a, of, of an NHS recovery plan, a commitment around uh, doubling the, the carer's allowance supplement this winter through the introduction of the, the carer's allowance supplement bill, and uh, also commitments on uh, funding for extra teachers and pupil support assistance, as, as well as other uh, matters. Um, the programme for government was, was uh, focused or titled A Fairer, Greener Scotland, and, and I'm sure colleagues will have picked up on some of the, the headlines around that. Um, some of the kind of key highlights being um, commitments around resource and capital funding for frontline health services, uh, the rolling out of the Scottish child payment to children under 16 by the end of, of 22 and doubling it to £20 per week as quickly as possible thereafter and a commitment of around providing at least £1.8 billion over the course of the Parliament to make homes easier and greener to heat and uh, a commitment to prog progress the uh, decarbonisation of homes by 2030. There was obviously an, a, a reference and, and a care commitment to around the establishment of uh, a national care service. Um, and just picking up on the, 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 the query that, that came in on that before this meeting, that was obviously one of the, the central recommendations that came out of Derek Feely's report on the independent review of adult social care. Um, a consultation uh, was published, as, as uh, many colleagues will be aware, on the 9th of August, uh, and that's due to close on the 2nd of November. Uh, the consultation is designed to be as a, a kind of open and broad conversation on the future of social care, uh, speaking to as many people as uh, possible, and uh, the government is committed uh, to listening to to the views of everyone who who responds. There was an easy to read version of the consultation launched on the 30th of August, and that was why the deadline was extended to the 2nd of November to reflect this. Um, the government is continuing to engage with a large number of stakeholders, uh, and so far approximately 3,000 people have registered for the public engagement events. Uh, and I'm obviously aware of some of the kind of key concerns that have been raised by COSLA and uh, local government uh, in relation to the consultation. Uh, and clearly a, a key part of that is, is ongoing discussion between the Scottish government and uh, local government uh, on that. Um, there has been an establishment of a, a social covenant steering group uh, made up of people with lived experience to ensure uh, that the new service is designed around the needs of care users and support the needs of, of care workers. Uh, and clearly in the last week or so, uh, on a broad, broad and general level, there's been a lot of discussion about social care funding, but uh, probably limited uh, in what I can say on, on that uh, just now. Um, clearly at a government level, a lot of work going on in the continued uh, response to uh, COVID space as well. But um, uh, I think uh, uh, at this point, I'll maybe just draw to a close and happy to take any questions, Chair on anything I've said so far. Thank you very much for that, Richard. I'm sure members will find that helpful um, update provided. I'll maybe kick off and then I'll open up for further questions. Um, you obviously mentioned there about the, the National Care Service and the uh, ongoing um, consultation process and um, you know the fact that it was uh, based on the independent review of adult social care or the Feely report as, as most people call it these days. Um, but my question I suppose is around 
the actual inclusion of a number of other services within the consultation um, that's taking place just now, which I think caught uh, most people by surprise, given it goes much further than the recommendations that were within the original report. And I suppose from a community planning partnership position, um, a number of the services being mentioned will obviously have an impact on some of the partnership working that goes on within the community planning partners and it's it's really around um you know whether you know the reasoning behind these um additional services being taken in and you know what what the government's basing that on if you've got any idea of that and also um around whether they'll be welcoming excuse me um feedback coming from community planning partnerships in relation to this given uh, the nature and breadth of the proposals that are on the table Yeah, thanks, Chair, and I'll, I'll certainly um, uh, relay some of that as well to to the the team that are, are leading on this. Um, maybe maybe two or three things that, that I could say. I mean, I think um, certainly uh, your your point about the uh, uh, wider breadth maybe of the consultation than, than than what was in the independent review, the Feely report, has been a comment that's come back from from another number of people um, and and has been uh, has been raised. I think the 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 intention or the ambition was to go beyond that, that j just the recommendations of the review and to look at something uh, more comprehensive, a more comprehensive look at community health and social care services. Um, so that was why uh, the, the, the consultation did did go broader. But I think picking up on your point about uh, CPPs, I think uh, as a result, I think it would be absolutely right and appropriate given, as you've said, the wider impact that there is for co community planning partnerships, for that there to be that engagement uh, and for uh, there to be uh, a chance for, for, for the CPPs to respond to that. But uh, certainly I, uh, the point you make is something that others have raised and, uh, uh, and, and is one that's, that's, uh, that's been reflected upon. OK, th thanks for that. That's helpful. Just maybe a, a, a quick follow up, because um, I'm conscious, having read through um, the documents that have come out in relation to the consultation, that they do lack a bit of detail. And I understand that, you know, perhaps government will look at, you know, they want to do the consultation and get the feedback. But, you know, basic things around the finances, around, uh, you know, employment status and things like that are not covered in the report. And I think, um, you know, given the the wide ranging nature of the services that are being looked at and um, some of that detail. I just wondered when exactly the government felt that they might be able to come forward with some of that detail to put some meat on the bones. Yeah, so I mean, so this, this is something that over the course of the next uh, year um, it will we'll further work is, is clearly going on and clearly going on at pace. There is a, an, an, uh, an, an intention to come forward uh, with legislation towards the end of this uh, parliamentary uh, session. So uh, this will be work that, that is continuing to move forward over the course of the next number of months. I understand the point about uh, the detail that was in the, the consultation. Um, but I think this is something where that engagement will need to go on clearly beyond the 2nd of November when the, the consultation closes uh, and, and, and for there to be further discussion uh, about some of the detail uh, that, uh, that, that, that you raised, Chair. But I uh, understand the point uh, that, that you're making. OK, thanks. I appreciate that um, additional information. Any other questions for Richard on what you've heard or anything else? No, not seeing anybody indicating. Not sure. Virtually, I don't think there's anybody there. Is there? No. Okay. And um, thank you for for that, Richard. We appreciate you um, coming along today to to give us that update. Um, given what we've obviously heard in response to the, the the question that I've asked, are members happy for us to submit a response as a partnership to the to the consultation that's currently ongoing around that? Uh, national care service because I think it's important that the views of the partners within um, Aberdeen Community Planning um, Partnership are, are heard at that level. So are we content to do that? And um, we'll we'll speak with officers about the logistics of how we do that because we'll need to have that response in by the deadline date of the 2nd of November. But I'm sure that we can expedite that um, via email and things um, in that respect if we've got that agreement. Yes, Jonathan, do you want to come in? 
Thank you. Um, it was just to to kind of mirror what was said about the steering group at the moment. That certainly is a, a partnership. I think would be helpful. Um, but as a specific part of that, are we able to have input from those with lived experience as part of that response as well to make sure we're capturing both the the service delivery side, but also those that receive the support and how they might be affected locally and any recommendations they might have for how to best tailor it locally as well as our response as a partnership. Yeah, what, what I would say, Jonathan, is I think if we can manage to gather as much information as we can through our through partners, I think that that will help to to go into our submission. But I would also, you know, say to partners that we should be encouraging any groups that may be affected by the proposals that are coming within uh, the you know the consultation currently that we should encourage them to put in. Uh, feedback uh, in the consultation themselves, particularly given what we've heard from Richard today about um, the government wanting to engage with as many uh, people as possible during this period. So I, I would be saying to partners um, to use your channels and networks to encourage others to feedback as well, because it, you know, it could have fairly significant um, impact on services within in the city of Aberdeen, as it will across Scotland. So it's important that people have their say at this point. I'll maybe bring in um, Angela as well. It, just, just to add to that, Councillor Ling, the Scottish Government have produced some material for engagement with different community groups and, and with the Board's agreement, we can circulate that to partners. So you can then take it, Jonathan, through all your community structures as, as well. And then, of course, the, the legs, the structures that sit around the health and social care will also be doing a lot of public engagement with lived experience groups as, as well, but it might be useful to circulate that material from government that's been designed to support public engagement. Yeah, th thanks for that, Angela. I think that seems a sensible approach and I'm, I'm sure the board would support that and we'll get that um, information um, out. Okay, if there's nothing else in that, we'll move on to the next item, which is 2.1, which is the review of community planning Aberdeen, the membership, the leadership and the partner uh, representation. So, Michelle, do you want to say a few words about this? And then I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Councillor Ling. Um, this was a review that we conducted following the refresh of the LOIP um, to allow all members to uh, give them the opportunity to review the representation on the various outcome improvement groups. It also allowed us to do a check on uh, membership in terms of statutory um, members as defined by the Community Empowerment Act. So the review has highlighted three partners that are defined in the Act as community planning partners um, that are not represented on community plan in Aberdeen. At the moment, um, we are engaging with them by uh, an by OIGS to ident identify whether there's a specific role for them. Um, we now have no vacant uh, vice chair posts. They've all been filled through the review of membership. Um, and I also wanted to highlight the increased involvement from the two universities. The University of Aberdeen have identified a representative to be on all of our outcome improvement groups now, which is uh, very welcome. And we also have RGU, who, although had been invited to join us previously, are now taking the opportunity to be represented on the board and have also identified representatives on our outcome improvement groups. Um, finally, just as an intro, we have also revised the constitution, which is an appendix to the report. Thank you very much, um, Michelle, for that. And um, I'll open up for questions if anybody's got any. Yes, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, just to, to iterate again, really positive to see um, involvement from the broader partnership, a real success, I think, over the past maybe three four years that we've gone from those core partners and um, members like the Civic Forum that we're really grateful to have community involvement, but also the universities. One which had stood out to me as well was looking at the Federation of Small Business, um, perhaps in, in some ways similar to, to ACFO in that it, it's representative of a, a wider sector in many ways. I was just wondering, we might come to this later, in terms of the timeline for future project delivery, um, that with their involvement with the universities now, more involved as well, that there's a bit of flexibility and scope that if they wanted to contribute to some of the priority projects or the stretch outcomes, that there's room to do so without it being locked too firmly in place that they might struggle to find a way that they could input into it. Thank you for that, Michelle. Do you want to come back on that? 
I think absolutely the opportunity is there for all partners to contribute to the, the individual improvement projects and align themselves. So as project teams bring forward their charters and they're defining their, their project teams, then they will invite that membership from, from partners. That's very much uh, welcome. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I think it's really good to see RGU involved uh, and joining Aberdeen University and there's great scope to use their experience and, and resources. In terms of the locality em empowerment groups, I think it kind of follows on to some of the questions I've asked previously um, and also by email and thanks for your replies to that. It's, it's probably just a question and, and also an offer in terms of the participation level of the non-statutory groups and the uh, local uh, the empowerment groups, what kind of level have you got there? And if there's extra work needing done, that can ACFO help to cascade that out? Thanks for that, Paul. Michelle, do you want to come back? So in terms of involvement of wider partners that are, that are not core and their ability to participate, um, I would have to look at the, the detail of our projects to understand what that, that looks like, but um, in the main, what we present in the report are those groups that are committed to our outcome improvement groups. There will be other partners that are involved in the improvement projects, so it will vary depending on what their role is to, to the extent of their contribution. But certainly any support that you can offer to engage the third sector and get them more involved and, and raise their awareness that they have that opportunity would be really appreciated. OK, thank you for that. Any other? Questions? Not seeing any. Um, can I just ask, Michelle, you, you mentioned about the vice chair positions now being filled. I do notice on page 30 that we've still got the, the lead contact in relation to the Children's Services Board to be confirmed. Is uh, How close are we to doing that? That's a vacancy we're recruiting to at the moment. Um, it will be advertised on Friday. So once we have that post filled, that will be it's their substantive post to support that group. Um, in the meantime, there was some support from my project team there. Thanks for that, Michelle. I think I think that's helpful to get that update. And I mean, maybe I'll just say a few words. I mean, I, I think uh, Jonathan touched on it that it is really pleasing when you see the uh, wide range of partners that we've now got uh, contributing to the to the LOIP. And you know, we can't underestimate the work that's going on behind the scenes in order to make sure that that's happening. So, um, you know, just record my thanks to to Michelle, your your team and indeed the wider partnership, which, uh, you know, has now, you know, people are stepping up to make sure that those uh, positions are, are filled. And I think um, we should be heartened by that. Um, I think certainly, you know, Paul's obviously mentioned there about the locality groups and the neighbourhood partnerships and the empowerment uh, groups that we've got sitting there. And I think, um, you know, we're also seeing much more partnership collaboration at that level and, and you know, people um, helping with that. And I think we'll see from some of the papers later on the agenda um, how we're making that link to communities. Um, I, I think we've always had the link to the communities, but I think it's strengthened in in the uh, improvement projects and things that we've got. And, that, and that's pleasing to see as well. Um, I also think it's good that we're seeing the growing number of Aberdeen responsible businesses because it's mentioned obviously in this paper you've touched on how we've made improvements there and I, again we've got a further paper um, which uh, you know there's been a lot of hard work has gone on behind the scenes there and I think people in the city have always been uh, you know keen to do their bit um, in the business community but it's trying to make those links um, and, and pointing them in the right direction so I think that's really good as well. Um, now, we do have recommendations before us. Most, thing, most of them are about noting um, the memberships that we have at the various levels within the partnership. But we're also being asked to appoint uh, the Director of Commissioning as the Chair of the CPA Management Group, because that is a function of the Board to do that. So I'm hoping we'll get agreement on that. And we can welcome Gail Beattie into that uh, post. And uh, we're also being asked to approve the revised um, CPA constitution which is um, at appendix four so i'm hoping that members will be able to agree that yes thank you for that okay that oh sorry oh yes um gordon you have a question yeah you know it's a very small point here thank you no it's just by my maths on page uh, 28 it talks about 
individual uh, organisational membership, and, we, and we're down on page 28 as uh, the CPP management group and one of the outcome groups. Um, by my maths, looking at a, a, um, Appendix 2, we're actually on three of the outcome groups, so it's just if that could be noted. OK, th thanks for pointing that out. Um, we can get that updated, Michelle, can we? Yes. Thank um, you. Yeah. It's uh, it's important that we we get that right because I know that you're um, you're playing a, a a key role in a number of areas, Gordon. So we'll get that that changed. Thank um, you. Apart that. from that, are we happy to agree the papers? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that takes us on to three point one, which is the CPA improvement program for 2021-2023. Again, Michelle, do you want to say a few words and then I'll open up for questions? Thank you, Councillor Ling. Um, the revised CPA improvement programme is coming to you following the refresh of the LOIP. Um, you will see that the majority of the projects will go live by February next year, which has really increased the pace of how we're initiating our projects. And the intention of that is that we're making um, a lot quicker progress with the achievement of the improvement aims and not focusing so much on that initiation stage, which is still very important to give a very strong foundation for our improvement work. Um, we've got most, the majority of our project managers have been confirmed now. I think there's just um, two outstanding, so hope that partners will be able to come forward with those. Um, and the only other thing that I wanted to highlight was that we do have um, a member of the Civic Forum that is leading one of our projects, which again, I think just shows how we're building relationships with communities and we'll of course make sure that representative has um, support and training from the partnership. Thank you for that, Michelle. I, yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with you. It's um, it, it shows how things are maturing and moving on um, when we've got somebody um, from the community leading on that. So I think that's really a, a really positive step. Um, can I open up for questions? Jonathan, do you have? You don't let me down. Thank you. It was just on the the note there. Um, I think the individual in question, Bob Farthing, he was leading on one of the um, prosperous economy groups, which he's been very excited about. Had the chance to bring his existing experience to bear, as well as developing new skills as well. Um, certainly, I know that uh, from the Civic Forum, also from ACFO, that we've often worked together to support community representatives coming forward. I think it's a really welcome offer to know that's available, as it's been throughout, from the partnership as well. Following on from Paul's question earlier, perhaps, about how can we get more of the community, more of the third sector more broadly involved, and it might be something offline from here, but could be useful perhaps to have a, a short welcome pack available specifically for members, not only of the community, but maybe non statutory partners so that whoever that staff member may be or community representative may be, there's a, a short introduction and also outlining the support that's available to them from the partnership as well as from their, their home organisation just to help them feel a bit more settled and um, particularly for meetings like this that they may feel is quite formal compared to what they're used to and make sure that they can live up to their full role. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jonathan. I, I think it is important because sometimes we take it for granted that people might be used to uh, operating in certain circumstances. I think I did read in some of the papers, Michelle, that we were looking to do sort of an induction wrap around for, for, for people coming into posts that they're maybe not been uh, familiar with previously. But I'm sure you could maybe take on board uh, the, the wider aspects that Jonathan's maybe covered there. I don't know whether you want to come back or not. Yes, absolutely. We're going to arrange um, an induction for all of the new um, representatives that will be coming to the outcome improvement groups. But I think also learning from the approach we've taken with the locality empowerment groups and the priority neighbourhood partnerships and the kind of support pack that they, they had for coming in. So we'll absolutely have that in place for Civic Forum members and any other community members um, that join us. And as you know, we're reaching out through the community empowerment group, uh, Jonathan, to other community groups to build their awareness of how they can get involved. So I think by asking them some of the questions we've got planned in workshops about what would make them more comfortable, we can really tailor uh, those support packages to, to suit their needs. Happy with that. Any other questions? Yes, Luan, I'll bring you in next. Thanks, Chair. Um, 
A few questions, if, if that's OK. Um, the first one is on the new project charters. And I'm looking at page 67 of the pack, and there's a number of bullet points to con for new, new um, charters to consider. I was interested to understand what the thinking is early, in an early, you know, developing a charter around exit strategies or, you know, where what happens once the, the, the pilot period is ended, just to make sure we're, we're really thinking about that from the start. We don't want obviously really great successful projects to happen and then not have a plan for how they will be scaled up um, after their initial period. So that's my first question. OK, thanks for that, Luanne. I'll bring Michelle in on that one. We do have a section of the um, project charter that is a project plan, so that's looking beyond your testing period. So it talks about how you would develop an implementation plan to put in place any changes that were proven to be successful permanently. Um, we also have a section in the charter that identifies early on which resources you might require if your change ideas do demonstrate success. So I think in the short term, when we're testing small, um, we can often resource that ourselves, but longer term, if we, as we start to scale up and spread, there may be a resource requirement. So that is a new section of the charter um, to enable us to actually scan funding opportunities that are available there um, so that we can start to prepare for applying for some of that funding where changes um, are proven to be successful and of course longer term the idea is that we can embed these uh, change ideas in our, our structures permanently and resource them that way but I think that's the, the value of the improvement methodology that you're able to test small with what you've got now um, but absolutely your project plan requires you to think a bit longer term. Okay, thank, thank you for that Michelle. Lan, are you happy with that? Do you want to move on to your next yeah, question? Yeah, thank you. That's that's helpful. It's important that these the exit plan is is thought about early early on, um, so there's time to secure the funding. So that's good. Um, I just had a couple of other quick questions that are around sort of some of the data that's in the in the work plans. Um, if that's okay. Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So the first one is there's a there's one where we're providing support. 15 care experienced young people to progress into employment so on page 75 of the pack. Um, my, my question was just how was the figure of 15 um, got to, to uh, and I wonder what the potential scope of that is to be a much larger figure. So I wanted to understand that a bit more. And the second one was about um, the earlier identification of young people with eating disorders. Uh, I think it's on page 83. Um, and so it's looking to dramatically increase the number of young people that are identified and I wondered if there had been planning with service to make sure that there was capacity to respond to additional demand and um, that, that would be would come about as a result of that. Thank you. Thank you Luan. Are you able to provide any response to that Michelle? I think um, just at a high level I, I can respond in terms of the numbers, I think, for that first example of the 15K experienced um, without Angela Taylor or a representative from Aberdeen Prospers being here, um, I suspect that they will have um, taken um, an attempt to something that seemed reasonable and realistic given current resources um, and using their current data. But I would have to go back to them to get a more um, substantive reply to that one. Um, and in terms of the second example you gave there, really this is why we need the charters to come forward, that have the multi-agency teams around the development of them to articulate their theory of change and to consider any resource requirements that would be needed around testing these changes. So the charters which come to the board are very important because they set out the rationale for these uh, change ideas, resource requirements and give board members an opportunity for them to review those charters to see if they if they have confidence in, in what's being proposed. Hey, thanks for that, Michelle. I mean, we can obviously maybe see about additional information um, on, on some of that numbers for you, Luan, and, and take that offline. You know, we'll send that out if it is available. But are you content with with that from or do you have any follow up? No, that, that's fine. Thank you. OK. Um, any other questions from anybody? Not seeing any. 
No. Okay. Um, well, maybe just say a, a couple of words again. I mean, thanks again for the, the work that's going on into this behind the scenes in order to be able to present the paper to us. Um, I, I think it's, uh, again, it's, it's good news that we are, uh, you know, the projects that are coming forward are addressing um, the, the priorities that we've got. I think, again, it will be welcomed by the, the board that we have honed in now. We've got the 75 uh, projects rather than the larger number that we had before the refresh. And I, I think that's that's a good move because it does allow us to have that sharper focus on the areas where, um, as partners, we're collaborating because there will be work that's going on in our uh, own organisations that will be um, obviously contributing towards achieving those LOIP outcomes. But um, this, as a partnership, I think it, it helps to hone that focus. Um, I th the other thing that I obviously mentioned earlier, which I think is is good, is that the improvement programme clearly links to, to both the LOIP and the locality plans. And um, I think it's important that that's closely aligned, um, particularly to what our communities have said is important to them and what their priorities for improvement are. And, uh, you know, you, you can see from the, the number of projects, both um, the new projects and indeed those that are established, that there are uh, clear links between um, a large number of those uh, to those community um, aims and outcomes. So um, we've mentioned there, I think, Michelle, about the fact that the, the new projects will come forward, the project charters will come forward to the board um, for approval. So we'll have an opportunity to look at those, um, ask questions on that. Um, and the established projects have been aligned to the community um, ideas that are out there. And they'll also, um, they'll, they'll make sure that the, um, the, the current change ideas will be achieving the project aims within the time scales that they, they lay down. But we will um, hopefully see that completed by December 21. But the revised charters, if we agree the recommendations, will be approved by the relevant um, outcome improvement groups um, instead of coming back to the board, which I think is a sensible approach as well. So um, if we can approve the recommendations as they appear on page 68, which is approving the improvement programme, um, agreeing that we will approve the new projects at the board and the OIGs will approve the revised charters to the existing projects. Are we happy to do that? Yes. OK, thank you. Right, let's move on then to the 3.2, which is the improvement programme. And this is around the reporting processes that will be in place. So, Michelle, do you want to say a few words about that? And then I'll take questions. Thank you, Councillor Ling. Um, the report sets out the, the audience for reporting um, on our improvement projects, and that's from the CPA board to members of the public. Um, as you've just said, Councillor Ling, the proposal is that new project charters will come to the board, but that outcome improvements will have the autonomy to approve revised charters. And the purpose of that is to allow the board now to focus on progress of projects um, and really to, to nurture their challenge and their support role in ensuring we can bring these projects along. Um, as you've said, the improvement programme does that mapping of the community ideas which have been identified from the locality plans. And we intend that there won't be any separate reporting on those community ideas. The project updates that come forward will identify um, progress against community ideas also. We've also got our online improvement project dashboard um, that will be new and improved and making it easier to identify um, good news stories or areas which require attention. So again, just trying to make more efficient use of the board's time to draw their attention to those areas that they can help support. Um, we will continue to have an annual report against the LOIP and we will continue to have separate annual reports for our each of our locality plans. So you do get that focused overview of what's going on in localities as well. OK, thanks for that, Michelle. I think that's helpful. Um, any questions or comments for Michelle? Jonathan, we'll bring you in. Yeah, um, I think Michelle had um, touched on it already, that it was really positive to see such a focus on how with the work being taken forward um, without there being any delay to that or pause on it able to bring in communities along the way but also to incorporate ideas um, and I think 
well, it's always been the case, but I think being so clear about the fact that it's not simply an option for communities to contribute to a, an identified aim or an existing one, but to come forward with an idea and able to do that, not just at the locality groups and the priority neighbourhood partnerships, but able to get involved in the, the scale that some of these projects are, is going to be really welcome, particularly at a time um, when there's a lot of rebuilding work going on in communities and in the third sector as well to get these groups up and running. Um, so really to lead on from that, again, can pick up after here, but I think gives a real opportunity. I know there's the event coming up with the community empowerment group to offer communities as they're rebuilding the groups within them. Here is something you can be involved with from the start. This can be part of the foundation of what you're about, not just the passing on of a recommendation, but to be part of delivering on making a change in the community. So really welcome there. And then from a community planning perspective, two things that stood out to me were specific mention of if there's a barrier, we want the management group, we want the outcome group, the board if necessary to know about it. I know we've had projects before where there's been an issue about the, the robustness of data or the capacity of staff to be involved or whatever it might be. So I'm really glad to see that that's mentioned here too. And then finally, I think having such a, a robust performance framework is going to generate potentially a lot more buy-in, certainly involvement from those of us here. But as we look ahead, we might want to bring in new partners as well and being able to show at a glance, here's the progress we're making, here's the innovation we're taking forward, um, I think will hold us in good stead. So overall, I think really well done, really pleased to see a focus on what are the barriers, really pleased to see a focus on how can we include community ideas. So thank you for that. Thank you for that, Jonathan. I think there's a number of very good points made there. I don't know, Michelle, if you want to come back on any of it or just happy to endorse that. OK, any other questions? Yes, Luanne, I'll bring you in. Thank you. Just following on really from, from what Jonathan's said, I suppose um, it's still we have 75 projects and it's quite a lot. Um, I just wonder if there's opportunities that the board can be that supportive, critical friend um, to, to some of the areas where there may be challenges and whether that, you know, will we get reports on areas where there are challenges and allow us to do a bit more of a deep dive into into some areas, not to interfere, but to, as I say, to be that critical friend or, or what's, I just wondered what's the thinking around um, around how we'll see those those areas where maybe progress isn't being made. Okay, thanks for that, Luan. I, I think I'll bring Gail in as, uh, first, and then if Michelle wants to say anything. Thank you, Chair. Um, I absolutely agree, Luan. Um, that's that's the purpose of looking at the performance framework, so that as the management group, we can identify those um, issues early on, and make sure that we are identifying things to the board for their um, for their consideration and and help in terms of in terms of resolving those issues but one of the things that we were really clear in the in the last management group meeting when this approach was was discussed was that this gives us a much clearer framework in order to identify those issues and um, particularly when you're looking across a broad portfolio of projects okay thank you for that um do you want to come back luan you happy with that um, I would just say I mean, that sounds good. I think we should just be seen as a resource to be used as a board, you know, and not to hold back on bringing things that are not working. You know, we want to have that good culture of transparency and, and working together and, and, you know, we can provide some objectivity that, that might might be helpful. So that's all. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point, Luan. I don't think anybody would disagree that, um, you know, if we can get in early and, and uh, you know, identify problems and issues and provide uh, help and support and solutions to that, I think everybody would be in favour of that um, completely. Any other questions or comments? Not, not seeing any. Um, just to underline what others have said, you know, really good piece of work. I think it shows how we've, um, you know, uh, moving things forward, we've looked at things that perhaps have caused us challenges in the past and, and brought forward new um, processes in order to try and, um, I, you know, uh, deal with the issues that we've had. Um, the other aspect, I suppose, is around that, the community link. And, I, you know, I think it's, it's important that the system that we're putting in place does allow, um, you know, support from professionals and communities and, and that we're listening to each other. 
um, because that's what will make, uh, you know, um, we'll be able to achieve our aims if, if we uh, have that positive um, engagement and communication with each other. And I think um, it, it's also about taking on the um, the ideas and the, and the work that's going on in the ground and, you know, moving that that forward and ensuring that it does meet the needs of our, our communities. And I think I'm heartened anyway by um, the information that we've got within the report around how that process will help us do that moving forward. So we do have um, recommendations on page 111, which is um, noting the revised project charter templates that are there. And I think that standardisation will help um, in that respect as well. And for the reasons that people have identified during the, the questioning, I think we're um, noting the revised project updates that are there, which um, clearly shows that connection between the um, community ideas and the locality plans that we have. Um, and agreeing the outcome improvement groups, the management group and the board will use the new interface for reporting progress towards the stretch outcomes and of the individual improvement projects and that this be used for the next meeting um, with the chairs of the outcome improvement groups speaking to the progress of their respective stretch outcomes at the CPA management group stage. So I think that will be helpful and that can then be fed up to the board where we've got issues and we can deal with the, you know, as Luann's pointed out there, provide our help and support um, around some of that when it's reported up. So I'm hoping that members will approve the recommendations as we've got them in the report. Not seeing anybody dissenting from that, so we can move on, I think. Thank you. Okay, that then takes us on to 4.1, which is the update um, on the alignment of the private sector, corporate social responsibility, um, and it's a, the, their alignment with the LOIP. So, Michelle, do you want to say a few words on this, and then I'll open up for a question. Just a, a few words. Um, in terms of the paper, it provides an update in progress since we launched the online CSR platform um, and we held our event last year. What we've got at the moment is eight new business partners. Now, I appreciate that doesn't sound like a huge number of businesses, but it is coming from a baseline of zero. And what I would say is I think these are genuine, engaged businesses. They have contributed already and there are ongoing discussions about how they can do more and they are being very positive about our partnership. They're very important role models for other businesses across the city who want to get involved but not sure how. I did want to highlight specifically the contribution of Barclays Bank. They have come on board to do some work to support young carers, um, which started off as a, an award but is now evolving into sponsorship of, of more activities. But maybe more, most significantly, they're one of the, the first business to come on board um, an outcome improvement group. So they are involved in our new anti-poverty group. They've got a range of services that hopefully we can take advantage of our expertise around uh, money mentoring and digital skills um, specifically. So uh, a fantastic example of progression there that we would want to continue to showcase to encourage other businesses to get involved. Um, what I would say is this has all been in kind of running in parallel with the work that we do with contractors around community benefit clauses. And at this point, what we are proposing is that we might bring these two related strands together now um, under the banner of responsible businesses um, in Aberdeen. And what we're proposing is to ground this work in the LOIP um, with a revised improvement aim. So there is a current aim in the LOIP around the community um, business clauses that we are making a proposal to expand this to recognise the uh, desire to build our responsible business network across the partnership. Um, so we're making that proposal to you today and also to hold up, hold a follow up event um, this year with businesses in November. Thank you very much, Michelle. I can hardly believe it's almost a year since we did that event. Actually, it's uh, time's flown past. Um, I'll maybe open up for questions or comments. Anybody? Yes, Paul, take you in. Thanks very much, Chair. Michelle, this is a, a fantastic piece of work um, and I'm really happy to see under 3.3 .3, 
that you've spoke with Maggie and the team at ACFO about the affiliates because I'd noted it doing affiliates and, and I've seen it there. So I think ACFO has been really successful with that. Um, so there's a real opportunity there and, and I'm really happy to kind of support that on behalf of ACFO. Um, in terms of the Section 75 and then business contributions when there's development, I think that's really, really positive because one of the things over the years, I think community organisations and reps have always struggled with is to understand what's available. Um, if you've got your kind of year to the ground in your own community, that's really um, positive and helpful. But there'll be many who doesn't know what kind of funding's available through various development. So that would be fantastic and someone I'd really support um, and, and kind of sharing that information citywide. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, Paul. That's useful. Any other? Yes, I've got a hand up. I'm not sure who it is. Luan. Yes, I'll bring you in, Luan. Thanks. And just really an offer that if you've got details for the November event, I'm happy to share through our networks. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly of NHS, Grampian and the, the big capital builds that they've got on just to make sure that those companies are included and aware of this. Thank you. Thanks for that, Luan. That's very helpful. And I, we'd put out a plea to all partners, I think, if you can share once we've got the dates and things organised to share that through your networks so that we can get as as wide uh, uh, attendance as, as possible. That would be useful. So thank you, Luan, for that. Anything else? Not seeing anybody indicating. Um, maybe just a, a couple of comments because, you know, Paul's mentioned there that, you know, it is a great piece of work and, and it is. And I, I know for a fact that a lot of hard work has gone in behind the scenes. And um, Michelle, I think in her opening remarks said, you know, eight businesses or whatever, it maybe doesn't seem much. But given the current COVID situation that we've all experienced over the last 18 months, I think it's, you know, you're, it's commendable that um, the, we've managed to secure um, those businesses and actually the, the the value that they've brought on the ground for the work that they've done to date. And, you know, I was involved in the Barclays aspect with our um, care experience, our, our, our young carers, which, um, you know, clearly at that event, um, the delight of, of those young people at being recognised was significant and um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to us managing to roll that out, um, you know, in the in the months and years to come. But also the aspect that you mentioned there about um, some of the help and support that they're giving around financial aspects, and that will be key, um, particularly as we come out of the COVID situation and, and the way that people are struggling um, with poverty and things in various aspects. You know, I think that will be invaluable as well. Um, we can't underestimate the importance of us trying to work with the business community. I mentioned earlier that I think there are lots of businesses out there who want to do their bit. They want to feel that they're contributing and sometimes they're just not aware of how they can do it. So I think the online platform has been very important as well because it gives us a one-stop shop in effect, hopefully, where people can come and get that information. Um, Paul mentioned there about the importance of some of the capital projects and linking that to communities. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at Gail as well in her, in her previous role because obviously she's in, uh, done a number of Section 75s where it's signed up. Sometimes it's not quite as simple as we, we'd like it to be where there's some money is available and it can just be you know, put to whatever project we would like in the communities. Unfortunately, uh, there are some restrictions around some of that stuff. But I do think as public sector um, organisations, we do have the ability to use our capital programmes to greatest effect for the communities. So that may well be around the Section 75 um, that we're signing up, but also around how we secure training opportunities within the um, actual construction phase itself. So whether it's apprenticeships and, uh, you know, mentoring opportunities, working with local schools and various things. Certainly as a council, we are um, endeavouring to do that. We've had quite an ambitious capital programme over uh, the last maybe nine years, um, and we have endeavoured to do that. And we've had some very successful collaborations with partners. And I would just say to, to other partners within the community planning partnership that, um, you know, I would encourage you to, sorry, I'm being attacked by a fly at the moment. Um, I'd encourage you, if you can, to um, try and make sure that you're looking at those when you have the opportunities within your capital programme um, to ensure that we're, uh, you know, delivering on some of the outcomes that we have within the, the LOIP. Um, so on that basis, I think um, as Michelle pointed out we are actually being asked to change uh, one of the aims that we had in relation to this. I think it's a success. Uh, it's a sensible um, 
suggesting to change to that. So I'm hoping that people will agree that the recommendations are on page 136 and we're agreeing to amend the current Lloyd project and community benefit clauses to to read increasing the number of responsible businesses working with community planning Aberdeen through community benefits and CSR activity by 200% by 2023. And I think that is doable um, if we all pull together. So I'm hoping that we can agree that. And uh, we're requesting that partners consider a representative to be involved in the project and support the promotion of this initiative. So we've obviously heard from Luan that she's keen to do that, um, as are others. Um, who've indicated, uh, Paul, thank you for that. Um, so hopefully we can agree the um, recommendations around that. Yeah, happy to do that. Thank you. OK, that then takes us on to 4.2, which is our child-friendly city update. And then Michelle's getting a rest here, I think, because I think we've got Matt Reid is going to um, just give us a, 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 a few words before I open up for questions. So I'm hoping that Matt's with us virtually. There he is. I am. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just um, really the the purpose of that uh, th this particular report is really just a kind of an update, highlighting some of the kind of recent progress that we've made within the program. And um, I think one of the things I, I really want to kind of highlight is we've we've had um, a really good amount of support from some of our key partners, particularly with the police and the NHS. And I think having a kind of a distributed leadership approach and rethinking a little bit some of our kind of project team support around it has really allowed us to make quite significant progress in the last several months. And um, so I think we're, we're very much in a good position um, in terms of reaching the delivery aspects of this project. There are a few couple, a uh, few pieces of work that we're kind of looking to just finalise and develop, which I'd like to potentially bring to the board again, just by way of update, which will really kind of set out very specifically what some of our intended outcomes are and what what progress will look like in terms of kind of short term uh, progress, that longer term piece in the sustainable progress as we kind of finalise specific outcomes that we're working towards collectively. But I mean, I think what I, I really just wanted to kind of highlight was I, I really do think that the partnerships that we've got around it are collaborating really effectively to improve outcomes and achieve these kind of common goals. Um, and we're also mindful as well, really, of the kind of guidance we'll expect some point quite soon from Scottish Government around kind of incorporation of children's rights into, into law. But where we are with the Child Friendly Cities work, we're really positioning ourselves, I think, very well to be uh, nicely placed for when that guidance um, is received by us. So that's really kind of the purpose of the award. I'm happy to take any kind of questions um, around it, but hopefully that's helpful just to kind of inform and advise where we are within the, the programme just now. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah, I think it's it's really helpful for the board to, to get that update because um, you know, and, and clearly reading through the report, we are, you know, we've made progress, which, you know, given the current circumstances is no easy feat, I know. So um, again, thanks to all those involved who've managed to move things forward. You've obviously pointed out the situation um, around the um, United Nations Convention of the, the Rights of the Child, the, the Scotland Bill, and and currently um, it's, a, it's a bit of an unknown because it's, uh, you know, it's sitting in... Um, legal uh, basis in the Supreme Court, I think, but hopefully we'll get something on that soon. But uh, as you pointed out, I think the fact that we've we'd already embarked on our child friendly city program um, stands us in good stead to be able to meet some of the things that I think will come through once that, uh, you know, once that's gone through the legal process. I'll maybe open up for questions to see if anybody has anything that they want to ask or comment on, um, Matt, and then we'll come sure. back. Anybody got anything on this? Jonathan, did you want to? Well, I'll start by saying it may be more of a, a, a legal, if not a constitutional response, not to dive too much into it. But thinking of earlier when we talked about a lot of partners currently who are in the community planning partnership, not necessarily statutory partners, but we've chosen as Aberdeen to invite them along anyway, that we've agreed it's something we want to do and we've moved ahead with. Bringing that over to here, is there a version of this, if not in its entirety, that even if there's not the, the legal duty, even if it's not in uh, statutory form for Scotland pending that Supreme Court decision, is it something that we in Aberdeen may choose to 
push ahead with anyway if we see a value in it for our young people as a city. To say nothing of the rest of Scotland may or may not choose to do the same as local authority and community planning partnerships. Yeah, I mean, Matt, I don't know if you want to come back, Matt, or? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I think absolutely where, where we're at is there will certainly be a, 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 based on what our current understanding is, there'll certainly be a legal obligation on kind of public authorities and public bodies um, to be ensuring that they're complying with the bill and that children's rights fundamentally in terms of decision making and so on should be a consideration. So there, there'll certainly be something adv advisory, if not legal beyond that. In terms of kind of our engagement with partners outside of those kind of named, I mean, I think there's always a, a bit of an open invitation, but we are currently reviewing some of the, the networks that we already have identified who are dealing directly with children and young people and looking to kind of incorporate and include them particularly in aspects around kind of participation within the kind of delivery of, of the project itself. Um, I'm not 100% sure I really answered that question, um, but I mean, that's certainly where, where our thinking lies at the moment. Okay, thanks for that. Do you want to come back, Jonathan? Are you happy with that? Yeah, yes, go on then. It was maybe just um, to draw attention that I know it's a, a significant point, but in terms of the, the content of what this is about, and we've we've gotten the officer report here, which is my understanding of it as well, that the, the challenge to the Supreme Court was that aspects of it fell in the, the UK government's opinion that it fell beyond the, the reach of Scotland's devolved powers. However, I think there's an important difference between that, that constitutional debate and the content of what this is, and in our the height of the ambition we have as a city to be child rights respecting and child friendly. Um, so I would I would hope I'd like to think that even if it were unsuccessful in the Supreme Court, quite a bulk of this work, particularly with the resource, the time we've put into preparation so far, would allow us to move ahead with some version of it, even if there wasn't the statutory obligation for us to do so. I'll just bring up Angela in on that one, Matt, and then oh, everybody's reaching for the buttons, but I saw Angela first, so bring Angela in first. Just, just, just to confirm, Jonathan, the partnership's decision on the child friendly was way in advance of, of the legal adoption of UNCR, so so I, I don't think there's a connection. Um, I, it would be um, convenient for all involved if there was a, a, you know, a happy chance of that the framework that, that's put in place and the guidance that Matt referred to as part of the UNCR, I mean, it'd be, it would be very convenient if there was a kind of consistency between that and, and the UN, uh, sorry, in the child-friendly um, framework. But, but uh, you know, I, I, we'll wait and see what happens. I think there is a, that there's a consistency, but the two are, are completely inter are independent of each other. And therefore, this decision isn't predicated on the outcome of the Supreme Court. Um, but what hopefully we're hoping is that partners can see that by following in, in the path to get the accreditation here, that we set ourselves really well as a collective partnership to be able to demonstrate to government if the UNCR is incorporated, that we are then able to completely comply with all of those duties, both in the primary and in the secondary legislation. So I think we will we will continue at pace, Jonathan, to progress this. But they are two independent factors. But as I say, it it would be nice and convenient if we you know if there was a what there was an alignment. But we're well positioned either way for both this accreditation and in time, hopefully being able to demonstrate to, to, to government that we're able to comply fully with the, the law as it then is finally incorporated into, into Scots law and the, and the guidance. But I hope that this helps partners and it'll help us all to demonstrate our, our compliance in due course of the law. But there are two distinct um, decisions, I think, that, that, that we're making. Thanks for that, Angela. That was maybe my fault because I mentioned it when I first thing. But yeah, thank you. You've um, eloquently dis um, described exactly where we are with that, Angela. So I appreciate that. Um, any other questions? Yes, I think Luan. Yeah, thanks. It sounds like lots of lots of activities going on. I'm just interested to understand how how are we gathering evidence or data or case studies that actually all this activity is having the desired impact on young people and actually improving young people's lives. 
um, as opposed to demonstrating all the activities we're doing. How do we answer the so what question, I, I suppose, is, is my question. OK, Matt, do you want to come back on that one? Yeah, um, so within the kind of the, the action log frame that we're kind of developing at the moment with partners and, and going to be having a sign off from UNICEF on, that part of that framework uh, lists really quite clearly what our means of verification are. So what we are considering very closely is in terms of what are we gathering in terms of evidence and how do we demonstrate impact. So that will vary slightly dependent on what those specific outcomes are. Um, as I said, we've kind of got different badge leads leading on different areas within that, and we're all kind of collaborating collectively um, and feeding into that. So different different pieces of evidence will be gathered depending on what those specific outcomes are. But that is something we're extremely conscious of is making sure that we have robust evidence to demonstrate that these actually are impactful um, and that they are improving outcomes. So part of that will be really looking to establish kind of baselines and then looking to have these future evaluations. But that will be part of our kind of longer delivery aspects of the, of the program and it'll be an ongoing thing that we are doing and beyond that also we're looking to kind of showcase and demonstrate examples of kind of good practice and we're looking to kind of collect them as we go um, and there may be cases for specific case studies to be written up and on specific projects or specific things that are happening as we go and um, so i suppose there isn't one clear way that we're gathering evidence it's going to be a combination of different kind of approaches some of that will absolutely be quantitative some of that may be a little bit more qualitative depending on the types of kind of engagement or activity that's been delivered uh, but absolutely we will we will be looking to measure impact as we as we go with the program and making sure that it is actually having that desired impact okay thank you for that matt are you happy with that response, Luan? You want to come back? I'm just really pleased to hear it's it's a it's a complex area, so it's right that the the data and or the evidence gathering is qualitative and quantitative. So no, thank you. Good answer. Thank you. Thanks for that. Any other questions or comments? Not seeing anybody indicating. No. Okay. Um, we have recommendations before us. Um, continuing to endorse our child-friendly city work. Um, I think the responses we've heard around the table, I think there's support for that. Um, we also want to make sure that we're promoting the children's rights and in, in engagement, engaging with uh, the training opportunities. You'll see from the next steps that are listed within the report that there will be training opportunities and it's just to encourage partners to you know, make sure that you're um, taking those up um, when they're offered. And um, there's also, uh, Matt's mentioned there, that it would be the intention to come back with future progress reports to the board um, on the uh, progress that's being made and the actions that uh, might be necessary. And uh, as I say, there's the next steps there, which just gives a, a, a timeline for that. So are we comfortable to approve the recommendations? Yes, thank you. OK, I think that then takes us to the end, apart from just to confirm the date of the next meeting, which we've got as the 30th of November, um, which will be here before we know it, I'm sure. Um, but to thank everybody for their attendance today, those who've attended in person, it's very nice to see you all face to face for the first time in a very long time. Um, and for those that have attended virtually, we appreciate your time today and look forward to seeing you um, in November. Hopefully we can all get together by then and uh, um, you know have a, a meeting in person which I think most of us are craving because it's been a long time since we've been able to do that in great numbers but thank you for your attendance today it's appreciated thank you